began talking a few weeks ago about re-imaging the church uh, and how that we need to, we, we, we use religious words like wineskins and new things and new and new and new and change and change and change. And yet often all we do is rearrange everything that we already have and already believe. And it looks different, but it's the same stuff, maybe in a different order. Uh, a paradigm shift is not rearranging things. A paradigm shift is seeing something like you've never saw it before. A paradigm shift means I see something like I'm seeing it for the first time. And the challenge with us reimagining and reimaging the church is it's very difficult to see something that you saw a thousand times like you've never saw it. It's, it's, I would say it, it will require a revelation of, by the Spirit for that to happen because if it's just filtering through our experiences and filtering through the way we've always done things, then you'll put it in your box, I'll put it in my box, we'll put it in our, bear, in our boundaries, and that's how we always see it. And then God comes along and says, I want you to see it like you've never saw it. I want you to re-image it. And uh, so the first message that I preached in this uh, little series of thoughts is the challenge. So what is our challenge? Our challenge is that. It, we need a paradigm shift. And I've been hearing shift and change and, and, and revolution, and, and I've, I've been hearing this a good 20 years. And I know it's been going on longer than that, but I've been hearing it. I've been preaching it. Uh, but uh, implementing and walking out is a little different. Amen? Uh, so uh, I do think that's where we are. Uh, I talked about the fact that this last year, especially with the pandemic and everything challenging status quo, challenging the church, challenging life, whether it's business life, family life, the economy, the politics, all of that stuff has, has really put us in a place which gave us a real uh, opportunity to, to take a new perspective. Uh, and I've said this many times over the last year, uh, if, uh, if, if what church does is limited to what happens on a Sunday morning or Saturday or whatever day you may gather uh, as, as, a, as an assembly, if, if that is the full expression and experience you have as church, then the last year when it became non-essential and we had shutdowns and, and, and lockdowns and all that stuff happened, if you lost your two-hour meeting uh, and that was your church, then you need to rethink your church. Amen. Uh, because in reality, if... Uh, if if we look back through this season and where we are today, if we had real relationships, if we were doing life together, if we had all manner of life experience together, and I don't mean we all do it all at the same time together, but together, we're doing this thing called life, uh, then whether we have this building or not is irrelevant. I'm not against the building. I've said this over and over, and I'm going to say it again. I'm not against... Uh, the church as we know it as far as what we do Sundays. I'm not against the worshiping, the preaching, the teaching, the, the, all the things we do. Uh, I'm not saying those things are not an expression or a tool or a vehicle of the church, but if that's all we got, then all we've got is programs and all we have is rituals. Amen. Amen. Uh, so I'm not against them. I'm just saying, please, please don't, if that's your box, your box is way too small. Amen. If a pandemic can take the box away that's got your church in it, your church and your box is way too small. Amen. So not only did it expose that, but it also, I believe, revealed. It revealed the reality of where things are authentic. They did not die. They thrived. Amen. Amen. So I talked about what the challenge was, and then I talked about the real call, uh, that call back to the heart of the Father. That's very important to me. It's key. Uh, that what are we really called? What is this calling for us? Is it to be church members? Is it to, to be on a platform? Is it to have some uh, institutional belonging we call church? If it's just that. If we miss the heart of the Father, 
If we miss the heart of the Father, I'm telling you, then, then we have missed the whole boat. Amen? Uh, it is only when you really get that connection, that revelation of the heart of the Father that you can find real identity in your sonship where you can displace the orphan heart, that performing need to perform, uh, and just find acceptance in the Father's house. Amen? Y'all okay? Uh, and I ask these questions because it's important, I think, to, to measure, inspect, or be honest about some things. And these were some questions that I'm going to repeat a couple more times, but very simple questions. You know, what are we doing? You know, why are we doing it? And how are we doing it? Uh, I'm convinced it all starts with our heart connection to the Father, and I'm convinced it all ends with being a disciple, uh, a follower, and not only being one, but making them. Amen. If, you, if, you've, not, if you've not moved to the place of, of becoming and then producing, then you've, we've not fully come to the mature place that, that we're purposed to be. Amen? And I don't mean you need to go start a school or be some giant ministry. Uh, you, it could just be one or two people in your life. But who are you discipling? Who are you mentoring? Who are you doing life with? Amen. Uh, and uh, anyway, so, so that's, that's the where we're going. That's, that's ultimately even the vision of this house and Pastor Kevin, the things we talk about, uh, the foundation of the mission and the purpose of this church. You know, we're loving God. We're loving people. We're, you know, we're reaching nations. We're building families. We use all that language. But you have to ask yourself, you know, what are we doing? Well, if that's what we're doing, why are we doing it? And if you have a valid what and you have a valid why, then the hard question is, how are you doing it? How are you doing it? Because if you can't put a how you're doing it and, and, and put, see it in action, uh, then, then you've just got a philosophy. Maybe even a good philosophy, but it's still just a philosophy until you do it. Amen. Y'all okay? So uh, we move from that, you know, the how and the why and the what. Uh, today I'm going to move us from the, from the fatherhood, the connection to the father, to uh, what I think is the next in, inevitable step. Uh, and I'm going to make it real simple. Everybody say brotherhood. 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 I want to read Matthew chapter 12, verse 46 to 50 to start with. Uh, Matthew chapter 12, verse 46 to 50. Praise God. Matthew 12, 46 to 50. Are you ready? You ready? Here we go. If you're timing me, now I'm preaching. <laughs> it says, and while he talked to the people, behold, his mother and his brethren stood without, desiring to speak with him. It's just, and one of them said to him, Behold, your mother and your brethren are standing without, outside. They desire to speak with you. And he answered and he said unto him, that told him, Who is my mother? <laughs> Who are my brethren? And then he stretched forth his hand toward his disciples. And he said, Behold, my mother and my brethren. Can you imagine what the guy must have first thought when they said, Jesus, your mother, Mary, and your brethren, they're here, they want to talk to you. And it's almost like Jesus had some mental breakdown. He said, who's my mother? <laughs> who's my brother? But Jesus, Jesus is always saying something deeper than this on the surface. And what he says, uh, 
oftentimes we get to look at it through all the years of commentary and diagnosis. And but in the moment, Mama's standing outside. The brothers are standing outside. And Jesus took that moment to identify something that I want to help us identify today. I'm not disrespecting my mother when I say this. I'm just quoting Jesus. And somebody said it a minute ago, Miss Brooke, I think, when she talked about this, our faith family. I can tell you today that in the realm of the Spirit and in the heavens and in the heart of God, how he sees us is not by our natural bloodlines. Or do they matter? Sure they can matter. But are they, the, are they preeminent? Absolutely not. Jesus looks at what he called disciples. He says, if you want to know who my family is, it is these disciples. Amen? The ones that's doing the will of my father, he said. But, but he called them disciples. These are my brethren. His natural mama and natural brothers is standing right outside the door. He said, that's not necessarily my brothers. Amen? Here's what I want to say. As we move from connecting to the Father, if you and I find a common connection to the same Father, that in essence is what makes, gives us the atmosphere, the place to be true brothers. Amen? Amen? Uh, we cannot have a full expression and experience of what God wants to do as a church unless we have a, a better understanding, revelation of what it means to be in this thing we call the brotherhood. Maybe we should quit calling it church and start calling it the brotherhood. The brethren. We call each other bishops, apostles, teachers, pastors. We use all these titles, church. Amen? It's, I sound so anti-everything, anti-church, anti-titles. Anti I just think we got a real dysfunction going on. <laughs> uh, how many of you, I'm leaving my notes, I didn't even got started. How many of you remember when, when Saul, uh, Saul of Tarsus, you know, he gets blinded, he gets knocked off his beast, and, you know, and God speaks to him, and, and then God goes and speaks to Ananias, the prophet basically says, Ananias, won't you go down here and pray for this man because I've called him and yada, yada, yada. And I love the language. You can go read it for yourself. Uh, but when, when Ananias finally, after God, has to straighten him out about who Saul was, but Ananias shows up and he walks in and blinds Saul. The persecutor, murderer, has been praying. And the first words out of Ananias' mouth when he speaks to him, he says, Brother Saul. The Lord has sent me. He called him brother. Amen? And when you read Paul's letter to all of his churches, he's over and over and over talking about my beloved brother, my beloved brother, my beloved brother. Uh, and, and there was this, this camaraderie, this, this faithful connection of hearts that the early church had that was not institutional. It was not just signing agreements and joining like we join in some kind of club. These people gave their hearts to each other at a whole different level than I think we're comfortable with sometimes in, in our 21st century church. Amen. But that's where it flourishes. That's where what God's called us to be will flourish. It's the only way it'll flourish. Uh, Genesis 4, very familiar story. I want to read it to you again. Genesis 4. Genesis 4, verse 1 through 10. You ready? Just read through this. Is my wife out of here? Man, we got sex talk going on again in the church. <laughs> You know, I'll just, I don't know if y'all see me over there. You know, Brenda says, we don't want to talk about sex in the church. I'm going, I do. <laughs> and food and money. <laughs> uh, anyway. 
Adam knew his wife, and that means they had an intimate encounter. How about that? Uh, and she became pregnant. And when she gave birth to Cain, she said, with the Lord's help, I have produced a man. And later she gave birth to his brother and named him Abel. And when they grew up, Abel became a shepherd and Cain cultivated the ground. And when it was time for the harvest, Cain presented some of his crops as a gift to the Lord. And Abel brought a gift of the best of the firstborn lambs from his flock and the Lord accepted Abel and his gift. But he did not accept Cain and his gift. And this made Cain very angry and he looked dejected. Why are you so angry? The Lord asked. <laughs> Why do you look so dejected? He says, you will be accepted if you do what's right. If you refuse to do what is right, then watch out. Sin is crouching at the door, eager to control you. But you must subdue it and be its master. So one day Cain suggested to his brother, let's go out into the fields. And while they were in the field, Cain attacked his brother, Abel, and killed him. And afterward the Lord asked Cain, where's your brother? Where's Abel? I don't know, Cain responded. Am I my brother's guardian? And the Lord said, what have you done? Listen, your brother's blood cries out to me from the ground. When I read that story, there's a thousand things we could talk about, the hows and the whys and the whats, and I just need to focus today. When you, when things get dysfunctional, disconnected, or out of order, it's very important for you to realize it's not just going to affect you, but it's going to affect those around you, those that are connected to you, those that you're responsible for. You can't just say, I'm going to do my own thing, and then turn around and not be held responsible or accountable for the consequences of your choices. And I'm not talking about Cain and Abel. I'm talking about Adam and Eve. As soon as Adam became disconnected from his creator, his father, as soon as he lost his identity as the true son that he was, as soon as that happened, all the, dis all the chaos and dysfunction and, and, and division and everything was... The created order got disrupted. Literally, all the created order became disrupted. And Cain and Abel are merely the, the collateral damage of what happens when things get out of order. Amen? So here's, here's the first two brothers in history who should be partners, who should be celebrating one another. But because there is a lack of continuity between the fathers and the sons and the heart of the father, what do we see? We see competitiveness. We see jealousy. We see anger. They were both uniquely qualified for what they were doing, and both of them had opportunities to worship God the way God created them to worship Him. He didn't say you've got to bring the same offering he brought. He didn't say you've got to worship just like he worships. He says you just got to do it with the right heart. You've got to do it from a pure motive. You've got to do it from where I created you. But instead of aligning and adjusting himself, he began to compare himself. Well, why did God bless you and not me? Why does God love you and not me? So now it, instead of getting to the root of the problem, they start to fight one another and brothers begin to kill each other. And the brotherhood that God intended is, is out the gate in, in chaos. Amen? And I promise you it was because it all disconnected from the Father. 
and from the heart of God. Amen? So the dysfunction was not just Cain and Abel. But I love the question. God always asks questions when he wants to prick our hearts. Where's your brother? <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> yeah, lie. But here's what happens when, you, when you're dysfunctional, when you, have a, when you have a wounded heart, when you, have a, when you have an orphan heart, when you don't know who you are, other than the fact that you compete and you, and you literally kill or assassinate other people's identities. When God himself approaches you, now we attack his character. Here's how he did it. He says, where's your brother? He says, am I my brother's keeper? You know what he was saying? I ain't responsible for him, you are. You couldn't guard him, you couldn't keep him. (laughs) That's what happens when you have a root of bitterness, a root identity problem, even when God approaches you. Y'all have no idea what miracle happened here last week. I'm going to help you. Uh, I talked about the fatherhood of God and the orphan thing, and, and I've been writing a book for two years on that subject, and I preached less than an hour. <laughs> but I got, I got to touch something when I think about the brotherhood being our brother's keeper. And I want to ask you a question. Are you your brother's keeper? Are you responsible? I think there's actually actually a direct implication that God is asking the question because he understands he's failed at one of his most basic requirements. Guard your relationships. You want to say that back to me? Guard your relationships. Guard your relationships. Can you fight inside them? Absolutely. Can you disagree? Absolutely. We grow together. We walk together. We find out why God accepted what I did and he didn't you. Let's don't kill each other. Let's ask ourselves the hard questions. Let's dialogue. Amen? See, if all we do is gather around people we agree and we just associate with people that that affirm everything we already know, how much growth are we going to have? Amen? Amen? And could it be that there's still some more growth needed in your life? Do you think you might can learn a few more things that you don't know? Amen. I can. Amen. So God brings folks along and connects us in our lives for those that will actually uh, provoke us, challenge us, confront us. Amen. But either, most of the time we, we run from them or we kill them. Now, I, know that I hope you ain't killed nobody, but we kill people all the time with our words. We assassinate their characters. We assassinate their reputations. We, 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 we do it all the time. We kill their dreams. We kill their visions. Our words are powerful. So I've been, I've been working on my book, and I I've, and I've found another book, and this, this guy has just unfolded a whole other level. Of, of what I had already been seeing. And some of you remember when I did some of the Father series, I talked about the dysfunction of David's house and how that as you look at what happened in David's house uh, with his own children and what a tragedy it was. And, and we, get, we get a little uncomfortable when somebody will get up with the audacity and say, you know, David really messed up. King David, warrior David, worshiper David, psalm right David. I mean, we got a whole list of accolades and medals and banners we can give David. Even Jesus comes along and calls himself the son of David. But as I was thinking about what happened with Cain and Abel, and I look at what happened to David and his family, this, this, this writer of the book, and I would tell you his name if I knew it, 
uh, but basically he said, well, you, you, you can't just start with David and his children. You've got to start with David and his brothers. And you've got to start with David and his father. And you look at that dysfunction and that dejection, that rejection, and then what was happening in David's lives. Long before David was a king or a warrior, he was a, he was a little boy. Living in a house with men that should have been his brothers. With a father that should have been his covering and his, his affirmation. He didn't have it. We know that's true. You see it played out over and over in David's life. All the way up until the time that, that, that the prophet comes and he's, he's ready to anoint the next king. And when they call the brothers in, guess who wasn't there? Just another one of those days where he got dejected. Just another day that the root went deeper. Amen? And then later in life, here's David. Now he's king. Now he's got kids of his own. And because he refuses to be the father and take the ownership and responsibility of, 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 of nurturing his own house, his own children, what dysfunction. Amnon rapes his sister, Tamar. Absalom comes along, murders his brother. I ain't going to preach all that again, but my whole point is all of this stuff started somewhere down the, long before that day. And if we don't get to the root of it, then all we're going to do is rearrange the things, try to patch things up, try to press on through, plow on through, and that's, that's, my, that's me. Press on, plow on. Instead of getting to the root of our shame, the root of our insecurities. And can I tell you, it's not just enough for you to connect to the heart of the Father. Because ultimately, it is, in the, it is in this atmosphere, this place called brotherhood, that this is lived out. You ever get around people that them and God got their own thing going? Yeah, me too. Uh, that's not healthy. Now, there's times God will pull you to isolation. I know that. I've been there. But ultimately, it is not unless we have our connections with one another that we have a way to walk this thing out. Amen? We live it out with a bunch of imperfect people. <laughs> people with a past. People with pain. People who, who've been wounded. And I don't even have time to go into Solomon, but it continued after David with Solomon. Praise God. I want to read Psalm 127.1 again. This I've already preached, but it's foundational for understanding the brotherhood. Uh, Psalm 127 and verse 1, we've, hopefully you've got this by now. Except the Lord build the house, they labor in vain that build it. Just want to, that's all I want to talk about. Except the Lord build the house, and, and there's, there's, this is not talking about a building. It's talking about something else. Uh, the house that God is building, he's building it, and that word build there, in its literal original meanings, means to build by obtaining sons. It's not build a building with, with, with architecture. It's not building organizations with all these titles and, and programs and rituals and, and doctrines. And See, we think building the church is, you know, I asked our mentor in class two or three years ago, we sat down and said, okay, if God dropped you on an island somewhere all by yourself, and you're the only Christian on that island. And God sent you there and said, go build my church. Well, how would you do it? What would you do? And the list was varied, but what but, but, but we found out is nobody said we got to rent a building. Nobody said we got to get the best praise and worship leader on the island. Amen? See, our, our logical process as as we played that out was what well, we're gonna pray for sure you know we definitely gonna pray and hear from God but ultimately you're gonna have to relate to people 
You're going to have to build relationships with people so you can begin to do life together. Amen. What if it's that simple now? Let's build the family. Let God build His house the way He intends to build His house. And this is it. He builds the house by obtaining or developing or bringing us into sonship. Our identity with, with the Father. And guess what? If you're a son, are you a son? He's a son. Raise your hands if you're a son. Praise God. Everybody should raise your hands. Guess what? If we're all sons with the same father, that makes us all brothers. Amen? Not church members. Brothers. The brotherhood is so much different than just membership in an organization. Uh, if you go back to Adam and Eve and you follow this, this story and you get all the way back to David, in between there, how many of you remember the story of Isaac, Ishmael? Warfare, brothers. Jacob and Esau, warfare. Joseph and his brothers. See, all this dysfunction ultimately gets played out in this thing we call the family. Amen. <laughs> you know, it's safer to just visit church. A whole lot safer to just visit church. Folks have left this ministry over the years, not since Pastor Kevin's been leading, but when I was leading. <laughs> when I was leading. <laughs> I can only be, I'm going to be responsible for me. People have left... <laughs> over the years, and I've actually gone to some of them. You, ever, you know, in, in, a, in a corporation, uh, bi especially your bigger corporations, they have what they call exit interviews. You may know what an exit interview is? That, that is, let's sit down now that you've quit. Tell me what you really think. That's what an exit interview is. <laughs> I tried to do some exit interviews with some church members, church family. I only did a few because they were so brutal I couldn't take it. <laughs> I'm like, man, we give you our heart. We give you our lives. And you just quit and left. Uh, but oftentimes what I would hear underneath the surface uh, was, uh, I just want to go somewhere and be comfortable. I just want to go somewhere and it be simple. I just want to go somewhere and it be safe. Those sound like good things. But it's not following Jesus. <laughs> that is not what Jesus said. Come follow me and it'll be safe and simple and easy. <laughs> he said, follow me and you're going to carry a cross. Follow me, some people are going to hate you. Follow me and you're going to have to sacrifice. Follow me and you're going to have to grow up. Follow me to the cross. So some people leave when you preach that. <laughs> Because doing life together is very messy. It's very ugly. It's very unpredictable. It being vulnerable. Listen, until you have given yourself in relationship, and I'm not saying this in a perverse, until you've really given your heart and soul to one another, you don't know what I'm preaching. You might know it here, but until it's happened here, David and Jonathan, the scripture says, they walk together in such a relationship that God knit their hearts together. So much so that Jonathan, who was supposed to be the heir to the throne, gave his throne to David. Literally gave his inheritance, his royalty. Said, David, God has raised you up for this. And because he's knit our hearts together, if you're on the throne, I'm on the throne. If you succeed, I succeed. That is what giving ourselves to one another is. It's not me surviving or me criticizing you or killing you because God accepted you or rejected that. See, that's brotherhood. I may wade out in some dangerous water here, but here I go. How many of you ever heard of this thing called the Muslim Brotherhood? You trace it all the way back to Ishmael and Isaac. It's not the Muslim church. It's not the Muslim religion. It's the Muslim brotherhood. 
You know why they've survived and thrived and changed much of the world that they, they, they've attempted to change? Because they really are a brotherhood. They're not a religious institution. They're not smiling saying, Jesus loves you. I told you I went out in a little bit of dangerous water there. We could learn something, though. We could learn something. <sighs> Not going that far. Um, I want to read 1 John 4.20. 1 John 4.20. Are you there? <clears throat> Here we go. If Kevin says, I love God, I'm trying to make this more practical for y'all. He just happens to be on the front. So here we go. If Kevin says, I love God, but he hates his Baptist brother, Catholic brother, whatever adjective you want to stick in there. If he, if he says, I love God, but he hates his brother, then Kevin is a liar. <laughs> For if Kevin loves not the brother that he can see, how can he love God in whom he hath not seen? Amen. See, our diversity in the church, you, you, can I tell you what one of our challenges is? We think about unity and diversity and, and all the full expressions of what God wants to do, and we, we, we intellectually, logically think we want to do that within the confines of this box right here. God, give us unity with our 100, our 120. What if he wants us to give unity with the whole church in the globe? Every expression of it. That makes you comfortable, uncomfortable because it makes me uncomfortable because some of them really rub me the wrong way. And I can get around some of them, and I was around some just not long ago. Some of y'all were there. And uh, I had to say amen often and then sometimes I just had to say Lord Jesus help them or help me help somebody because <laughs> I just couldn't amen and agree with some of the things they were saying uh, but could I stand with them in the city park of Fort Payne and pray for our city absolutely I could do that can I pray for the pastor down the road here that I know his doctrine and the not doctrine don't agree? Can I pray for him to, to have success and really mean it? Can you? Why? They're brothers. They're brothers. Confused? Maybe. Maybe you are. Maybe I am. Well, how about we walk together and sort that out? Well, we walk together what we can agree on. Amen. I have a, I have a strong opinion about a lot of things. Uh, and if you give me the chance, I'll tell you about them. I mean, really, in the right environment, a dialogue. I'm serious. Uh, but our problem is oftentimes we want to talk, but we don't want to listen. Amen. How many of you know you got two of these and one of these? There's a reason for that. <laughs> uh, so, so, so John is saying, how in the world can you say you love God? In other words, with your mouth, with your words, I love God. Well, do you love your brother? Do you love your sister? Do you love the family? <laughs> What a challenge to say, I can see you, brother. God has given me a tangible, material, natural thing right in front of me and says, walk together, love each other, walk together, love each other. 
And he says, don't tell me you love me if you can't love him or her or her or him or her or him. <laughs> oh, Jesus. First Peter 2, 17. Almost done. First Peter two seventeen. Ready? He says, Honor all. Man is parentheses, so we'll just leave it out. That means King James added it. If it's in parentheses. That's why I'm leaving it out. <laughs> He just says, honor all. Love the brotherhood. Fear God. Honor the king. We could revolutionize Christianity with that one verse. Amen. Honor all honor men honor women honor judges honor politicians honor authority honor your parents honor your kids honor your teachers honor 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 all amen that word honor literally means to give value to to give respect to now is all worthy of honor i would say not not all are worthy, not all are living honorably, not all are leading honorably, but he, he, the, the, this, he's not talking to them. He's talking to us. Our responsibility is our attitude towards it. Amen? I don't care if you're, you're Democrat or Republican or Libertarian or Communist. Didn't have to put that on the list, but now we do. <laughs> Oh. Give value to all. Give honor to all. Amen? It's a kingdom principle. You want honor in your life? You want blessing and favor in your life? You better learn to practice it. Amen? But then he says, he doesn't say honor the brotherhood. He didn't say honor the brotherhood. He didn't just say give it value, give it respect. He says agape, love the brotherhood. See, one is almost can be mechanical. It can be, it can just be a, 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 a conscious choice. I honor the President of the United States. I honor the leaders in our, in, in our political systems. I honor, I honor, I honor. I give it value. I give it respect. And even though my heart don't even connect to that, it is a discipline. It is a, it is a conviction for me to say it's the right thing to do. Amen? And I promise you, I'm not saying I'm perfect, but that is a, that is a, that is a core value of how we have lived our lives and conducted our ministry for many, many years. And it's never disappointed me once to do it. It's been painful. I've had to keep my mouth shut when I knew folks could be exposed. And I was taking heat for stuff that I could have just made one little speech and guess what? I'd have been in the clear, but guess what? I'd have threw them under the bus. So I said, God, let me be big enough to be the person of honor. Amen. And, and oftentimes a very, very small group of people knew that I was walking in honor when, when I was the one who, who was taking the crucifixion. <laughs> Amen. It's not always easy. But he didn't say honor the brotherhood. How many of you realize giving Agape love is very different than just giving value. I value you. That ain't the same as I agape you. 
Agape you means I've given you my, sp- my soul, my heart, my emotions. I-, I love you like I love myself. I honor you. I give you more than just a, a-, a value. I love you. Amen. And not just the ones you agree with, not just the ones you like. The brotherhood, the brotherhood, the brotherhood. Look, it don't say love the brothers. He's talking about a, 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 something bigger than individuals. He's talking about a brotherhood. No greater love does a man have than he would do what? Lay down his life for his friends, for his brothers? Would you lay down? See, see I know men, that, I know a lot of men that, that have and would lay down their lives for their families, for their children, and probably some mothers too. But, but the thing is, what, what if we said we lay our lives down for the brotherhood? What would that change? That you're my brother, you're my sister. We have this connection, this common connection. Amen. How many of you remember the questions? You know, what are we doing? Why are we doing it? How are we doing it? Well, here's the thing. What are we doing? I'm going to reverse my list, okay? What are we doing? At the end of the day, what we're doing is making, becoming, and making disciples. That's what we're doing. Why? Because we believe in all these value systems. We believe these things. Well, this is the middle of the, this is, this is where the, 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 the rubber meets the road, as we say. How are we doing it? Can I tell you it's by doing life together as brothers? And that's not a gender thing when I say that. I'm talking about we are sons in the same house. Amen? And if we're not careful, we will let what has been so dysfunctional historically all the way back to Adam and Eve when they gave us Cain and Abel. When we, had, when we have Isaac and Ishmael, we have all these brothers that are always fighting, always warring, always competing. Even the disciples. How many of you know that six of the disciples were, were literal brothers? Peter and Andrew were siblings. No wonder when they sat around and said, who's the greatest? He said, not you. <laughs> oh. And now Jesus, in his wisdom, let me change that. In my wisdom, Jesus would have not have picked any siblings. Ain't nothing like trying to do life with your siblings. <laughs> And yet Jesus takes Peter and Andrew, he he takes James and John, and he takes the other James and whatever his name was, uh, Thaddeus. They're siblings. And when I read that and thought about that, I said, no wonder them guys was always fighting and fussing. But he was turning their hearts to each other. He was turning their hearts to the Father. And it took the outpouring of the Holy Ghost on the day of Pentecost to really change them. So if you try to do this without the Holy Spirit, good luck. Amen? Amen. If you try to do this without God turning your heart, you're going to be frustrated. Amen? I can tell you the honest truth, and I've not always walked this out, but but, but, but I I have always prayed for, for the church at large in our community, always. Now, I may not get up here and make a big deal out of it, but years ago when I was praying, oh, God, bless my church, bless my ministry, bless my message, bless me, 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 me. And then he just convicted me one day. And he said, you need to start praying this. And he started naming names in our community. And I say, oh, Lord, bless brother so-and-so. I'm just saying. And he said, that ain't how he's praying for you. Oh, what a conviction. <laughs> oh, oh, Lord, bless him. Bless him just a little bit. Yeah. I, I didn't use those words, but I might as well. Just bless him just a little less than me. <laughs> and so he started turning my heart. He had to turn my heart. Because that, that ain't in our human nature, trust me. Y'all Okay. Honor all, honor, honor all. Give them value, give them respect, but do more than just honor the brotherhood. Love the brotherhood, love it. Love it so much that you give your life to it. Love it. Love the brotherhood. 
Fear God. Honor the king. Every one of those deserve a whole sermon. Hebrews 2, 11, my last scripture. I've kept my word three weeks in a row. My last scripture today. Thank you, Lord. Y'all awake? Jesus, the Holy One, makes us holy. And as what? Sons and daughters, we now belong to His same Father. So He is not ashamed or embarrassed to introduce us as his brothers and sisters. Has any of your brothers and sisters ever embarrassed you? Any of your kids ever embarrassed you? Has your spouse ever embarrassed you? <laughs> Have you ever embarrassed them? <laughs> See, we, we think God's dysfunctional like we are. He ain't. <laughs> he knows us intimately. And he doesn't put shame and guilt and condemnation on us. Amen? Jesus, our brother, the one that's ascended to the mercy seat, ascended to the throne of grace, the mediator, on behalf of us, Scripture says, he makes us holy. He makes us one. He's not embarrassed. There's so much shame buried in so many people. So much guilt, condemnation, competition. Amen. That corrupts our brotherhood. That creates animosity and envy and, and striving. Amen. I'm learning to love the brotherhood at a different level. In fact, I'm learning that if we don't get this father thing right, if we don't get our sonship right, if we don't get this brotherhood thing right, we're never going to get the commission right. Because it all has to flow out of that. Amen? Man, I was impressed with Eli during worship. I really was. But then the dude got up and walked down here, and the piano kept playing. <laughs> I said, now that's some anointing right there. <laughs> if I ever lay this mic down and keep, quit, keep preaching, y'all need to make sure you get it on video. <laughs> Praise God. Thank you, Lord. Let's stand. I'm going to bless you. We're going to come to the table of the Lord. Uh, as soon as we're done, there's food, fellowship next door. I assume we want to just release to that. Uh, but come to the table today, this table, before you go to that table. Uh, I was I was praying this morning, thinking about uh, we always kind of get some heads up about the music and the songs and the service, how at least some structure. And that first song we sang, you know, The Father's House, first time I heard that song, that line, check your shame at the door, man, it just pierced me. Because, you see, uh, sometimes we can con convince people to come, but we don't set them free. We don't really set them free. We say, come and repent and jump through all these hoops and do all this and the Father will love you. And all we do is heap shame on shame. So then we come in with our heads down. We come in with shackles and chains. Come to this table today without shame, without guilt. Thank you, Lord. I just want to pray this. This, this, is, this is generally for all of us, but I, I promise you right now, the Holy Spirit wants to do something for somebody 
there, there is a root that's taken down in some of the hearts of the people that feel so unworthy, so much shame because of choices and decisions and, and some of them out of our control. Some of them, we just made terrible choices. Come to the Father's table. Come without shame. Come without guilt. Find your place in the brotherhood. Father, I just release the healing virtue that only you have right now into every heart, every mind. I thank you for connecting our hearts to you and we can say we love you and we do. But let us love one another. Let us love the brotherhood. Build the house that you want to build, Lord. A household of sons and daughters, brothers and sisters. Lord, we release grace. We release mercy. We break the power of shame that's taken root in some people's lives, the guilt and condemnation. We break the power of it. Lord, Lord we just release the Holy Spirit to fill us today so we can really walk in harmony and love one another the way you want us to love one another. Let us honor all. Let us fear God. Help us today to love the brotherhood. We are our brother's keeper. We are responsible for guarding our relationships. We are family. Lord, we bless this table as we come, the broken body, the shed blood. Thank you for forgiveness of sins, acceptance in the blood, healing us because by your stripes we were healed. By your stripes we were healed. And by your blood we are redeemed. So we release those things today as we come to this table. We thank you for the food and the fellowship that's prepared, Lord. Bless that to nourish our bodies today. Bless these young people who are launching into their next. We just cover them today with our blessings to launch them into their future. We ask all these, agree in all these, in Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Please come to the table. Worship today. Worship today as you come.